I want you to take your copy of God's Word and stand. Can we do that? We're going to take our copy of God's Word and we're going to stand. And I'm going to share one verse. Maybe I won't preach long because it's just one verse that uh, jumped out at me this week that's really, really been on my heart. And I just want to share it with you. It's in Psalms 118, verse 24. It's a familiar verse. This is what the Bible says. It says, this is the day that the Lord had made. This is the day that the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You say, Pastor Benny, are, are you having a good day today? Great day. You say, well, why? <laughs> because I made up my mind a long time ago I was going to have a great day today. Amen? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm doing super good and expecting a drastic change for the better. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you. I pray that you will speak to us and through us. I thank you, God, for your incredible goodness. Have your will and way. Meet the needs of the people. And for all you do, we're going to praise you. God, I cannot. You never said I could. You can. You always said you would. Have your will and way. And I pray this in Christ's name for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about the importance of every day. The importance of every day. I remember many, many years ago getting up one morning and saying to Barbara, good morning. She said, good morning. She said, Benny, do you know what today is? And I began to process, what is today? Is today our anniversary? Is today my wife's birthday? I'll tell you how to always remember your wife's birthday. That's just forget it one year. Amen? <laughs> I began to think about what is today, but nevertheless, I went on to work and called a florist in the church and said, I want to send Barbara some flowers. They said, what's the occasion? I said, it doesn't matter. It's a special day. Send the flowers like I said. <laughs> then there's a little boutique. We do most of our shopping there. The name of it's Walmart. I ran by Walmart. I got her this pretty yellow dress and took her this pretty yellow dress home and walked in and I said, now tonight, don't you cook. Don't you cook. We're just not going to do it. We're going out and we're going to have a nice meal. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. And you wear this pretty dress that I bought you. And we did just that. It was a wonderful evening. We were getting ready to retire for the night. And I said, you know, Barbara, it's been a good day. She said, oh, Benny, it's been a great day. I said, you know, Barbara, I didn't forget. She said, no, Benny, you didn't forget. She said, you know, Benny, I believe it's been the greatest Groundhog's Day I've ever experienced. <laughs> Every day is important. Every day. And I want to take just a little time. And I want us to look at every day, and I want us to even look at this very specific day today, and I want you to see four things. The first thing I want you to see is this. Today is a provided day. Today is a provided day. You know when the scripture says this is the day that the Lord hath made, the word made there is the same word he used in the creation story. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I love what Joyce Meyer said. She said, every day is a gift from God. Learn to focus on the giver and enjoy the gift. Every day is a gift from God. Learn to focus on the giver and enjoy the gift. There was a football coach named Bear Bright. Bear Bright, by the way, that will be the only mention of football today. We want to talk about spiritual things. We're not talking about that. There was a great football coach named Bear Bright, and he died. And when they found his wallet, he had something in his wallet that his coaches said that he looked at and read every day. I have it here. This is what was in Bear Bright's wallet. He said, today is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or use it for good. But what I do today is important 
because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, the day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something I have traded for it. I wanted it to be gain and not loss, good and not evil, success and not failure, in order that I shall not regret the price that I have paid for it. Somebody said life is just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give an account if I abuse it. Life is just a minute, but eternity is in it. I want us to see, folks, today is a provided day. God's given us this day. But there's a second thing I want you to see. Not only is today a provided day, but today is a present day. <laughs> a present day. Now, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. And that's why they call it the present. Because today is a present day. Notice what that scripture says. This is the day which the Lord hath made. It was in the present tense. The psalmist was not looking back. The psalmist was not looking ahead. He said, this is the day. You know why some of you uh, were destroyed today? Because you're looking at yesterday. And we gotta realize that today is a present day. This is what I've learned about people. Many people won't enjoy today because they're haunted by yesterday. They, they, they won't enjoy today because they're haunted by yesterday. And, and, and here's what's so interesting. You say, Pastor, what haunts people? What about yesterday is haunting people? Well, first of all, past guilt. Past guilt. You know, uh, when I'm talking about guilt, I'm dealing with yesterday. Because see, sin creates guilt. And guilt creates shame. And shame affects how we view ourselves. A lot of people are not going to have a good day because they hadn't gotten over yesterday. Because they're still dealing with past guilt. You know, as you study the Bible, you, 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 you learn something. No matter how many times you've read it. I was reading the story about the prodigal son. Everybody here knows that story. Everybody listening to me online would know the story of the prodigal son. You know, he, he was a son, by the way. And he left the father. He left the family. He left what was good. And he went out and he started living sinful. He went out and started being with prostitutes. The Bible says this. He got so low, he literally got in the pig pen. Here's what I want you to understand. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. And make you pay more than you want to pay. What initially fascinates will eventually assassinate. What, 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 what initially thrills will eventually kill. And that prodigal goes out and he starts living sinful. This Jewish boy goes out and he starts living, interacting with these Gentiles. And I never understood this, folks. You, perhaps you did. But in Luke 15 and 20, the Bible says he came back home. Look what it says. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
Now, now, now look, here's what I thought for years. This is what I thought. I thought, well, that's good. I'll tell you what happened. He'd been away. Daddy had missed him. And that's why he ran to get him. But that's not totally true. Because let me explain something to you. In Jewish, in Jewish culture, they have a ceremony called kizazah. Kizazah. You say, Pastor Benny, what was a kizazah? It was a public display of shame. When a son left the family and he went out and he started living a sinful life, relationships were broken with the family. So a kizazah was when the older men of the community seen that boy coming home, they would go out and meet him and they would take a vase and they would take that vase and they would throw it at his feet and shatter it. It symbolized you've broken relationships. It symbolized you're done. It symbolized you've shamed your father. You've shamed your family. You've shamed your community. You're done. It was a kizazah. So now you got to understand when that father saw that boy, he ran. He ran because he said, no, no kizazah is going to take place. I'm going to let my son know that I love him. I'm going to let my son know that no matter what he's done, I'm willing to forgive him. I'm going to let my son know that he can be restored back into this family. Now, wait. Oh, it, it, it only gets better, folks. It only gets better. See, when he was a great way off at a Kizazah, those leaders came and they said, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on what you've done to your family. Shame on what you've done to your father. The father never went. Shame on you. But wait. The scripture said that he ran. <laughs> wait, wait, you got to understand. No, no, no. You got to understand. He had a tunic on. So two things happened. First of all, it was a shame and disgrace for a leader in the Bible, a father in the family to run. That was a shame, number one. Shame number two was for a father to show his legs. So I tell you what he had to do. He had to lift his tunic up. He had to show his legs and he had to run. You say, what happened? Here's what happened. See, instead of saying shame on you, that father said shame on me. Instead of shame on you, shame on me. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, let me tell you, that make a backslid Baptist shout. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. God didn't say shame on you. But he said, shame on me, and I've taken your shame. Let me tell you why people are haunted by the past. Past guilt. But let me tell you what else haunts people. Past glory. Past glory. You say, what are you talking about? I read about a baseball pitcher one time. He was a baseball pitcher. And he retired. But after he retired... He didn't know how to function in life. And they were interviewing him. And he said, all those years, I thought I was gripping the ball. But the ball was gripping me. I hear men talk to me about when they played high school football. When I won this award, when are you going to get over yourself? When are you going to get over you? Past guilt. 
past glory. But a lot of people are haunted by the past because of past grudges. This is all I'm going to say, folks. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a decision. And, 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 let, let me give you something to think about. In Genesis 45, Joseph forgave his brothers. Remember, they did something pretty bad to him. They sold him. <laughs> they, they sold him as a slave. That'd be pretty bad, by the way, right? When your brothers sell you as a slave. In Genesis 45, he said, no, no, it's forgiven. God orchestrated this. You're forgiven. But if you'll remember, when Jacob died in Genesis 50, they said, oh, he's going to get even with us now. Here's what I want you to see. It came back up. But Joseph said, no. I again make a decision to forgive. Get this down. You say, I forgave. But look, it's going to come back up. I'm just preaching where we live. It's going to come back up. And you've got to make that decision to say, no, no. I made a choice. I made a decision. I decided to forgive. <laughs> a guy walks by a bench. And a guy's sitting on the bench. And he's got a scrolled look on his face. And he says, friend, what's going on? He said, I'm sitting on a wasp. He said, well, why don't you get up? He said, because I think I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. <laughs> we don't forgive because we think we're hurting them. But the truth is we're hurting ourselves. See, a, a, a lot of people, a lot of people, are, are, are haunted by yesterday, but, but some have a heaviness over tomorrow. Now, now, here's what I want you to understand. If Jesus said something one time, folks, that'd be enough. Somebody said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Honey, if God said it, it's settled whether you believe it or not. It's forever settled in heaven. You say, well, my opinion, let me tell you something. If God has spoken on it, you don't have an opinion. The only opinion is God's. Let God be true and every man a liar, by the way. I have people ask me, where do you stand on this issue? Now, listen, it doesn't matter where I stand. It's what God's word says. So if God says something one time, that's enough. But what if he said it three times? And in Matthew 6, 25, Matthew 6, 31, and Matthew 6, 34, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Three times. You know what that tells me? I shouldn't be dominated by the election. No. No. I, I, listen, I shouldn't be dominated by COVID. No, no, I mean, you say, I don't, I don't like the way you're preaching. Well, you're, you're, you're rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way. Well, turn the cat around. The Bible literally says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't you worry about tomorrow. You say, Pastor Benny, uh, I mean, how have you handled it? How, how do you handle the, 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 the COVID situation? Well, look, look what Psalms 34 and 4 says. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. You say, I don't know, Pastor, how can I handle everything that's going on? I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And he delivered me from all of my fears. You say, well, I, I, I've had, Pastor, I've had some worry and concern. Help me out. I'm really going to help you out. 
I'm going to help you. You say, well, Pastor Benny, I'm, I'm concerned about what's going to happen with this election. I don't know what's going to happen with the economy. I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, no, I'm going to help you out. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 6 and 26. Matthew 6 and 26. Behold the birds of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Aren't you much better than they? Hey, somebody says, she eats like a bird. Let me give you a news flash. A bird eats two or three times its weight in food every day. A bird eats two to three times its weight in food every day. Corey Ten Boom said, Corey Ten Boom said, trust God. Leave the consequences to him. Corey Ten Boom said, worry won't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It will empty today of its strength. One teacher said, Johnny, how much is three-fourths of five-sixteenths? He said, I don't know, but I don't think it's enough to worry about. <laughs> I'm telling you, folks, the answer, are we going to trust God or not? People are scared to death, but I want to give you a news flash. God is still on the throne. COVID didn't take him by surprise, and we can trust him right in the middle of it. Here's what I want to say. Today is a provided day. Today is a present day. But I want you to know something else. I'm enjoying this, by the way. So much for I'm not going to preach long. Today <laughs> is a providential day. Today is a providential day. Now let me tell you something. Look what that verse says. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Now how can you do that? You can only do that if you understand the providence of God. Let me explain. When the Jewish people built the walls around Jerusalem. They came back. They rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. And there was a man by the name of Nehemiah. He comes back and gathers the people up. And in 52 days, they build the wall around Jerusalem. After they did that, they said this. They said Psalms 118 verse 24. On the dedication service, this is the day that the Lord had made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. They had accomplished something great. And you know what they said? This is the day that the Lord had made. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. You say, oh, that's wonderful, Pastor. Now let me tell you something else. When the Passover took place, Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room. If you'll notice, the Bible says in Matthew 26 and 30, after they celebrated the Passover, they sung a hymn. You said, Pastor, what did they sing? Well, you got to understand. They sang Psalms 113. through Psalms 118. So when Jesus celebrated the Passover and he was getting ready to go through to the cross, what he said, this is the day that the Lord had made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord had made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And what we've got to say is every day is a providential day. 
And we've got to say whether it's good, whether it's bad, God is in control. And according to Romans 8 and 28, God is working all things for my good. And every day is a providential day. God is leading. God is directing. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, I make a choice to lift my hands, lift my heart, and praise the Lord. Now, let me, let, me, let me tell you lastly, and I'm done. Today is a passing day. Today is a passing day. James 4.14 says this. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. You know what I've come to realize? Life is like a roll of toilet paper. It comes off faster when you get to the end of the roll. First, I was dying to finish high school and start college. Then I was dying to finish college and start working. Then I was dying to marry and have children. Then I was dying for my children to grow old enough that they'd move out. But then I was dying to retire. And now I'm dying. And suddenly I realized I forgot to live. Too busy to read the Bible. Too busy to wait and pray. Too busy to speak out kindly to someone by the way. Too busy to care and struggle to think of life to come. Too busy building mansions to plan for that heavenly home. Too busy to help a brother who faces the winter blast. Too busy to share his burden when self in the balance is cast. Too busy for all that is holy on earth beneath the sky. Too busy to serve the master, but not a one of us too busy to die. Today is a passing day. Just about every day of my life, I preach a funeral. You see, they're all dying of COVID. Listen, listen. I've preached two. Both of them were in their 80s with pre-existing conditions. But I am preaching funerals just about every day. Yesterday, 53 years old, right here, family, 53 years old. Tuesday, 44 years old, 10-year-old daughter, 10-year-old and 17-year-old. I'll look into their face, talk about the passing of their mother. Friend, we don't know when we're going to leave here. You say, Brother Benny, you're trying to just scare people. Oh, I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish I could wake people up, but only God can do that. Only God can do that. But I want you to know every day is passing. You say, well, Pastor Benny, I started this little sermon of mine out by saying, do you know what today is? Well, the Bible tells us what today is. You say, oh, it's so encouraging. The Bible tells us what today is. Oh, yes. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. Now, it's the day of salvation. I'll tell you what today is. Today is the day of salvation. <laughs> if you don't know the Lord, eternity's too long to be wrong. Today, today is the day. Why, Pastor? Why, why are you pressing so hard about today? Because Psalms 95, look at this. 
for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, wait, not tomorrow, today, if you hear his voice, today, if God is speaking to you, look, harden not your heart. Because every day that we say no to God, that old heart gets a little harder. And it gets a little easier to say no. No. That's why it's a serious thing when we say no to God. Because that old heart just gets harder. Today, today, if you don't know the Lord, it's the most important day of your life. Because today, you can know the Lord. <laughs>